Forced to work from home by your employer? Laid off or feeling depressed at home? Do you want to make money working from anywhere? We'll show you how to do it from your couch. It's time for another episode of the Work From Home Show. Coming to you from their homes in Austin, Texas and Tampa, Florida. Here are your hosts, Adam and Naresh. Welcome back to another episode of the Work From Home Show. I'm Naresh Vitsa with Adam Schrader coming to you from Tampa and Austin as usual. We haven't gone anywhere. Is that right, Adam? Uh, I went out to get uh, food. That's about it. (laughs) Yeah, well, we've gone five miles, maybe ten miles from our abodes. But today, Adam, I want to talk about a topic or follow up on a topic that we've touched on a couple of episodes and that is homeschooling and also just schooling in general. So I want to first start, though, with the schooling. I don't know if you saw the CDC's latest guidelines on schools and what schools need to do. I've seen the to... general premise, and it's, whoo-hoo. yeah, going to be rough, we'll put it that way. Well, I, I bring it up because... When you look at those rules, and we'll go over some of these rules, but when you look at them, you just kind of think to yourself, I should probably homeschool my kid. (laughs) (laughs) Especially if you send your kids to private school. These new guidelines essentially make private school a very, very expensive babysitter. That's really what what, what they essentially do. And look, (laughs) these rules, I think, are absolutely ridiculous. I have not been a fan of the CDC over the past, you know, since March. A lot of the data that they came out with, they've retracted. A lot of the rules that they came out with, they retracted, whether it was wiping things down or whether it was saying that 2 million, 3 million plus people were going to pass from the virus. I mean, this is policy. This is people's lives that are at stake here, whether through the virus or our children who need to go to school. (laughs) And I actually would have thought that a private school would take those CDC guidelines and just crumple it, throw it down the trash (laughs) and tell the government to piss off with their public education policies. But I've actually spoken to several parents. I don't know if you have, Adam, but I've spoken to several parents who send their kids to private schools and they had like these these like, you know, virtual parent teacher webinars not parent teacher. There were, it was yeah, like, these, like these uh, webinars, these Zoom sessions. And across the board, from what I've heard from my friends who send their kids to private schools, the schools are going to try to follow the CDC guidelines as much as possible to the best of their abilities. What's the best way to not get sued, or at least if you do get sued, to have a, a good backing behind you? You're right about that, but I, I will say that and let's go over some of these these restrictions and guidelines. And I'm actually afraid for kids now because now, for example, a preschooler who sneezes, like sneezing is considered, the CDC specifically singles out, you know, things like coughing or sneezing. And look, when you're in preschool, like, yeah, you're going to sneeze, you're going to cough. Like, anyone's going to do it, but a preschooler <laughs> is probably not going to be as, let's say, as uh, politically correct about sneezing. <laughs> And now they could get bullied or they could get timed out. Like they could get a timeout for not sneezing properly. And it's wild. And so there's no more, I don't want to say no more sneezing, but you have to do it properly. There's no more sharing. So you can't share toys. You can't share food. You can't share anything. You can't hold hands. No more field trips. No more school assemblies. These are all things that I not only love as a student, but even as an adult, (laughs) <laughs> I love attending these things. I love attending, you know, these adult field trips and lectures and talks. No more of those. No more sports. No more playgrounds. No more cafeterias. No more extra- extracurricular activities, co-curricular activities. No more volunteers. Uh, that's actually something I was, we interviewed Armin Broad, and he talked about fathers volunteering more. Well, no more volunteers. No more active parents, at least on, on site. It's just, to me, it's like, oh, and then the biggest thing, Adam, you're only allowed to be with one teacher the entire day. You're oh, not yeah, allowed that's to... insane. 
I mean, if at a younger age, it's fine. But man, you get up into, you know, even late elementary or middle, yeah. you know, especially like middle school and, and high school. I mean, come on. I mean, if you're going to do anything, I can see getting kids who are taking the same classes and sitting them in one class and have the teachers rotate. That might work. But man, yeah, what? It, no. Well, yeah. So you bring up a, a good point, which is we're not talking about pre. We're not talking about just preschoolers here. We're talking about schools. tenth graders, eleventh <laughs> graders. Yeah, we're talking about schools, and the colleges are going to be held to very similar guidelines as well. So it's only a matter of time until the CDC publishes their recommendations for the same things: field trips, sports, intramural dorms, etc. But to me, it's like, you know, just lock the kids up. <laughs> that, that's essentially what, what you're doing. And I have a very, very hard time believing that a preschooler or a kindergartner, even a 16-year-old, they're not going to be able to follow. Oh, the, the, the other rule, got to wear a face mask. I mean, how on earth is, I can't see anybody, regardless of their age, whether they're three, four years old or 14 years old, Wearing a face mask consistently at school. That's a tough thing to do. I struggle to do it when I go out. It'll become normal. I mean, just look at the Asian countries that they wear face masks all the time, even before this happened. I mean, it's just, it's something new for our society, and we'll get used to it if we decide to, to keep going with it. I don't know. I mean, I can see for the short term this happening in terms of uh, face masks, but I think once it blows over and we get the vaccine and all that stuff and people become less afraid of it, I think it'll go back to that. I mean, I think some of these are unfortunately going to stick around. But, I mean, some of these things are just... I'll, I read these when they first came out. I read some of them. And I was like, oh, they just don't want schools to open. I mean, that's... I mean, basically... Well, just, they, the they don't want schools opening. to open. Yeah. You would think that, but they, they are opening. Oh, under I understand. These... But whenever they're recommending, like... There is absolute... There is zero way that schools can open following the recommendations of the CDC because the CDC is recommending desks be six feet apart. So yeah, that's another one. The I mean, desks have to come be apart. on. They also have to bring in special dividers in if it's a boys' bathroom like a like the urinals, special approved dividers. Uh, even with the desks, there need to be special dividers. Look, I, I have not been a fan of the CDC. They recommend like I said, they they recommended wiping down everything around you like doorknobs handles seats furniture anything and everything people followed these rules for months and then they came out like two months later saying oh sorry like we actually did this study and you don't need to do that because viruses aren't passed through doorknobs and you know <laughs> seats and then they came out and recommended the cruise industry shut down until july 25th okay i get it but we had a cruise booked for july 4th weekend all right we're gonna have to take that crew some other time but they just they've been so off so wrong and i feel like with the kids this one struck me i don't even have a kid who's going to school like he's <laughs> he's not even one years old yet but but just reading this it, it actually angered me and now talking to my friends about their kids they said absolutely the schools are going to adopt these they're trying their best to adopt these guidelines and that's what these webinars have yeah. been about and if they don't adopt the guidelines like you said it can open them up to lawsuits other people other kids could feel not kids but maybe their parents could could get angry and there could be bullying or there could be problems it's a lot man it's this is a lot and and to me all it does is support the idea of homeschooling i think yeah it does but i mean we're gonna get to the article you you sent me in a little bit but I don't think it's going to grow as much as people think it's going to grow. I really don't. And I mean, although some of these things are trying to get people, my best hope for this that'll come out of this is that it will actually convince our government to invest in schools again. And to, you know, if you want to do this, if you want to, you know, get more space between kids, we need to build more schools. We need to hire more teachers. We need to do a whole, you know, start investing in the infrastructure of the schools, you know, repairing schools. Like there's a, the high school by me, it's in a nice part of town. They can't use part of the high school last year because it was infested with bats and they didn't what? have the money. They didn't have the money to get the bats out of the school. 
So that there was so just a strange. part of the school that was shut down because of bats. I mean, it's just... If I was a parent, I would have stepped up to the plate and said, <laughs> I'll donate the $300 to bring in the bat exterminator. Yeah, but I mean, that's just... It's something that's been needing to be done for a long time. And I think hopefully people will see all of this money that we're able to generate and realize that that's not the constraint that we have with this and we'll demand that money be spent on schools and we'll demand more schools because like the one near us, the, the elementary school near us and all of the elementary schools in Austin are overcrowded. They are all overcrowded. Our neighborhood, one school is 158%. I mean, it has 58% more students in it than it was designed to hold. There are portables the entire length of the back of the school. If they put any more portables in, they have to start removing parts of the playground. That is how overcrowded our schools are getting because, you know, we're just not building new schools anymore. And so I'm hoping that this virus, this pandemic leads us to actually start investing in school again. Because honestly, if we start investing in schools and the classroom sizes get smaller and, you know, they all have the needed amenities in them, like, you know, more books if you're not going to be sharing books, more whatever's all the material you actually need to run a good classroom, I would send my kid to school. Honestly, I mean, that's one of the biggest things is there's just, it's overcrowded. There's too many kids per teacher. There's too many kids crammed into a classroom. It's just, yeah, I'm hopeful. I'm, well, I'm not hopeful. What should I say? I want it, but I'm not hopeful. I don't think we'll actually get it. Well, a quick rundown of, of the guidelines. These stuck out. We talked about some of these already. You know, wearing the mask. I'll tell you, if I'm a little boy and I'm not able to look at the other faces in, in class, I remember kindergarten, it was the first time I realized that I was attracted to women. And if I'm not able to look at those pretty faces, well, you know, what are they trying to do? We, we, <laughs> we <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like uh, you might as well wear a football helmet. Um, and then the Don't no give my ears. Yeah, well, the no sharing, I actually, that's a huge problem. They're building very selfish people. Like, sharing is now almost like a kid crime uh, as far as these schools <laughs> or, or the CDC is, is laying down the law. As far as the no field trips or assemblies. Well, let's look, be honest. The field trips have been on their way out for years. Like, kids are barely going on any field trips these days because there's no money and just all the regulations on... Uh what schools have to do field trips have been dying a long time well, now, now pretty much they in. only do them at the end of the year well to me that ties into being in in the same classroom with the same teacher the entire day the problem i have with that is at least in the public school system um look there are some very very good public schools but the vast majority at least here in florida are not very good and so now you're stuck with this and I know this because I used to party a lot with with school teachers, but they're essentially locked down with moronic public school teachers who legitimately don't even have uh, college degrees. You don't need They've a college got... degree, huh? You don't need a college degree to at least to be a substitute. A lot of a lot of schools require them, and it's funny that people think that uh, private school teachers are better than public school. They're the exact same people. I mean, it's well, it depends on the private school. There's the best. So here in Tampa, there are like three top private schools. Then you got like 50 other private schools that probably are classified in, in the category that you're saying. But those three private schools are like legit. Where I grew up in Houston, same thing. There were three or four legit private schools out of the, you know, 50 or 60. And if you went to one of those three or four private schools, you got like PhDs teaching you, you know, history and biology and chemistry you don't have you know a college degree is not even good enough to teach high school at these schools you needed like legitimately a phd or like an ivy league master's degree and i told you i partied with a lot of these school te not the private school ones the public school ones and they don't even have college degrees they either got like an associates or they got you know like the teaching certification and some other you know, certifications. And that's, you know, I wouldn't want my kid locked in a classroom with, with a teacher like that for an entire year. Like I said, it's just, it's just babysitting by that point. Yeah. I love the recommendation. If they actually do this with the busing, 
it's going to mean that your kids have to wake up at some some kids are going to have to wake up incredibly early because they want kids to only do one per row skipping rows when possible and the only way they're going to do this is to add more bus routes and make more trips and then kids are going to have to wake up an extra 30 minutes earlier just to get to the bus and to get to school which is just going to make kids groggier at school and it's going to mean kids are sitting around at school waiting for the rest of the kids to get there Mm -hmm. it's uh well, the other thing, look, if, if they're going to be spending a lot of time with, with the teacher, now the schools have apparently asked the teachers during this summer break to learn skills, to learn how to speak Spanish and learn music and and PE. And there is just, I mean, maybe an Ivy League grad. To get into an Ivy League school, you have to be incredibly well-rounded. So... Yeah, maybe a private school that that has like an Ivy League caliber uh, or an Ivy League degree uh, teacher, they can do that. They they can probably teach math and Spanish and coach tennis and um, you know play the violin or the piano. But your average public school teacher is not going to be able to do that. And there's no way that the Ivy League students are going to sign up to be teachers all of a sudden. So this is. This is a crisis. It really is. And so I want to tie it into homeschooling because I do think that parents will realize maybe like a month or two into the school year, they'll realize like, you know what, this is just a complete waste of time for my kid. Like we got to, we got to do it at home. We got to do it at home. So Adam, why don't you share? Well, do you have any final thoughts before you, we, we move on? No, I think I'm ready to move on to this, uh, this next part. Okay. So, so Ron Paul, Congressman Dr. Ron Paul ran for president many times, very well known in the libertarian community, came out with this article about homeschooling, and he basically said that this is homeschooling's finest hour. Well, let's be honest, he also sells homeschool curriculum. I didn't know that. Yeah, he does. He has his own homeschool curriculum. So he has a conflict, slight conflict of interest, but yeah. Okay. Well, he came out with this piece, and he is essentially predicting that more people are going to homeschool their kids. And look, he, I think he shared some data and, or it was he, either him or Wayne Allen Root, who we also had on the show. But the data clearly shows if you homeschool your kids, your kids on paper are going to be smarter. They're going to get better <laughs> grades. They're going to have higher test scores, higher SAT scores. The average homeschooled kid scores 40 points higher on the SAT. That's out of 1,600. They score 40 points higher than the average public school kid. I don't know where private school falls in there, but they uh, were able to compare public school versus homeschooling. So what are the issues that you have with, first off, how about you just quickly break down what Ron Paul talks about, maybe a little bit more about his curriculum. Oh, and... I don't know anything about his curriculum. I, I don't believe most of the things that man does, so I'm not going to get his oh, curriculum. Oh, so you never even looked at it? No, his curriculum, no. homeschooling You have to pay for it, and I don't want to pay money to get something that I'm 99% sure I'm never going to want to teach my children. Well, I went to, uh, I actually used to go frequently to libertarian economics camp. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and this was, as well, they just tell you, school. don't do anything, leave it alone. <laughs> don't touch they, that. I tell you, those were some kooky, kooky. There, there were some, uh, the adults were actually seemed pretty normal, but the other kids it was it was actually a little too much for me. Like, whoa, this is wild. I had never met so many homeschooled kids in my life. And look, they libertarians are basically like conservative hippies. That's I think that's the best way to, <laughs> to, to put it. Yeah, that fits. <laughs> and so that was my introduction to economics and to I went for the first time when I was sixteen or seventeen, and then I went again. I've probably gone. Five or six times. Five times meaning that's five different summers that I've spent Jeez. at Libertarian uh, Economic. Because there was, they was a lot of fun. I like was learning you? a lot. And I, I feel like if kids are exposed, whether to me it doesn't matter what, whether it's left wing, you know, Keynesian economics or, you know, what, whatever. I think it, kids need to be exposed to this stuff as soon as possible. And there were like second graders. I was like a junior in high school when I went or a senior in high school. There were like second, third grade parents, you know, libertarian homeschooling parents sending their kids off 
to these camps in New York City and in, I want to say, Midland, Michigan is, is where another one was, and then Atlanta, Georgia. Those are the three main main locations. But yeah, that, that was my interaction with homeschooled kids, and they loved it. They kind of looked down on, on public school. P- public school was like the enemy to, <laughs> to these kids. It was like legitimately like the enemy. <laughs> But yeah, anyway, continue, Adam, with with the article. So, I mean, he doesn't say a ton here. Basically, he says he hates the CDC guidelines, and he says that school people, homeschoolers, score better on the SAT than kids in regular schools. They score better on academic and social tests that they do, and that um, he thinks more people are going to be um, starting to homeschool. And then he pitches his curriculum. But here's the thing I think is the big reason why he's incredibly wrong. The reason homeschooling isn't going to pick up is because most households in the United States need two incomes. The people who are able to homeschool, they're able to homeschool and their kids do better because they get one-on-one time with the teacher. If we are able to invest in our schools and get the classroom size down smaller, you'll see public school rates go up as well. The main people who homeschool are affluent people, you know, people who only need one income to survive as a family. I know there's the whole, you think of the conservative Christians doing it, and that is a chunk of it, but it's not all of it. And so it's, it's not something that people can just do. You know, you have to be in a position as a family where you can do it. And I don't think we're going to be coming out of this pandemic and have people saying, you know what, let's quit our jobs, you know, let, let's quit your job. We can live on, you know, $50,000 a year um, that I'm making and have the same lifestyle. I just, I don't see it. I can't see it happening. I would rather see our money and our time go into making our public schools better. So I think maybe the only thing that might happen is the stay-at-home moms, a couple of them might decide to homeschool instead of sending their kids to the public school. But... I can't see a large shift going to homeschool. Well, I kind of agree with that. Um, I'm actually not a fan of homeschooling. I definitely won't do it for my kids. I, but, but at the same time, I do believe that the, the best education is taught at home. So that is very different from homeschooling full time versus Mm -hmm. saying that the best education is taught at home. So me personally, I think by the time my kid goes to school, there's going to be a vaccine. and Everything will be like it is now. Everything's going to be like it is now. But with that being said, I do think parents should, and this, this is not going to happen, but I think parents should take seriously the idea of still being very active and involved at home outside of public school or the private school where they send their kid. But like you said, parents are busy. I mean, we don't know. This whole work-from-home movement, even if it ends up being semi-permanent, are parents going to still, you know, going to want to send their kids, or would they be more open to homeschooling their kids? So you said, well, even if you have two parents working, well, they're both working at home. So Right, but I I think people realize how difficult it is to both school and work from home. I mean, I'm able to do it because I don't work full-time. You know, I don't, I, it is, I would I not could be make, able to do it right now. Yeah. I could make a bunch more money if I wanted to dedicate, you know, 40, 50 hours a week to work and do more, but we don't need my income. So I'd work because I like it and I work because it gives us uh, extra income to do the things we want and to buy, you know, our real estate to set us up for later in life. But if I had to work full time from home, there's no way I could work full time from home and do the needed school to give my kid a good education. I mean, I could do it, but the kid, their kids wouldn't be getting a good education. But do you think if, if you were working from home full time and your wife, I mean, she's not going to be, but just hypothetical, if she was working from home full time and you're both at home, you still don't think there's enough energy to to spare for the kids on a daily basis. That'll depend on the job of the parents. Because if it's a job, like we've talked with some of the people who, you know, they track the time because these people have jobs like a customer service rep or something like that, where you actually have to be on the phone, 
listening to that or like uh, if, you're, if you work for Diana who was on the show earlier in the year and you're doing transcriptions you know if you have those kinds of jobs even if you can work from home you've got to be present and the other thing is you know if you're both working six hours out of the day and you're trying not to overlap you're going to be missing each other so much that it's going to hurt your family life in my opinion what and, do you mean and, by missing each other so like let's say that I have, to, I have to work six or eight hours a day. My wife has to work six to eight hours a day, and we have to school the kid in between, and let's say school takes two hours a day. Well, that means that I'm going to have to start, do my eight hours, she has to do her eight hours, and then we also have to do two hours of schooling. It just creates more time that you have to dedicate there and not time that y'all can like relax and spend it as a family doing the things you want to actually do. I mean, let's be honest. School is partially just daycare. I mean, I hate to say it. It's a lot more than that. It's a lot more than that, but it's daycare. I mean, that's, you break it down. It's a way for your child to get educated while you work. And so I just think it's asking too much of people to have two full-time jobs and still give their kid a good education. No, you're, 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 you're right. The other thing you brought up is the affluent tend to homeschool. Mm -hmm. And to homeschool, you do have to have an educated person at home who knows how to teach, you know, not just a multiplication tables properly, but who knows how our local governments work so they can teach social studies and who might know a second language and they can teach that language or who know geography. You know, these are things I know some extremely educated people who don't know any of these. They don't know a second language. They don't know their geography. They don't know any musical instruments or music in general. So now you're asking somebody. A, and, a and a lot of people don't want to be teachers. They don't want to do it. And that's fine. I mean, it's just, yeah, I think we're trying to push people into doing something just because. And, you know, you shouldn't feel if you're a parent working from home you should not feel guilty about sending your kid to school. Just think of it like you're going to the office. Your office is just in your house. There is nothing wrong with, you know, having somebody else do a good chunk of the teaching. Now, what I can see happening is I can see the schools changing themselves. And I think I brought it up in one of the interviews we did. It might have been with, I can see schools changing to the point where teachers do the video where teachers record their lessons and the kids' homework is to watch this 15-minute lesson that the teachers do. Yeah, that was Diana's episode, Yeah, and that's a great idea. Yeah, and I've seen it, and it works great from what I've... They did a trial of it somewhere. I can't remember where it was, and it worked fantastic because then the kids, when they were in school, they've all watched the video. You know, you've, you've only had to spend 15 minutes at home watching it instead of 45 minutes in the class. And then, because, you know, it used to be, what happens? Your teacher teaches you in the class. You go home and you do your homework, but you don't understand something in the homework. What can you do? There's nobody to ask. You know, you could ask your parents, but are they going to know the answer? Who knows? So then the next day at school, what do you have to spend the first half of the class doing? Talking about the homework, asking questions about the, the lesson. Instead, you do the lesson at home. You can rewind it, play it as many times as you need, and then you go to school and you do the work. I think it's a phenomenal idea. I think it'd be great if they they try to do that because kids have so much homework now anyway that even if they're having to watch a 15-minute video for each of their four to eight classes a day, that's still less homework than I hear kids are doing nowadays. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm just about out of thoughts on on this topic. And so, yeah, I, I don't I don't think we'll see a large increase in homeschooling, but I'm hopeful that we'll see a change in the public schooling. And if you are a parent who has kids who are either in school or going to be in school, contact your, you know, your local representatives and say, hey, we need, our schools need money. You know, we need money for our schools and we need schools. And we know the federal government is proving to us that they have money and they can give the states money to, you know, build new schools and not have to jack up our taxes so that, you know, our taxes for the state. Make it happen, people. It, it it helps everybody if we have an educated society. So 
Let's do it. Absolutely. Completely agree. So if you agree with Adam, or even if you disagree, reach out to us. Hello at workfromhomeshow.com. Hello at workfromhomeshow.com. Let us know how things go when you do reach out to your local leaders and your public school administrators. Hello at workfromhomeshow.com. Visit us, workfromhomeshow.com, to see all of our previous episodes on the Work From Home Show. We've had some great, great guest interviews, awesome episodes. It's just been, man, it's been, we're like halfway through the season, Adam, and it's been uh, just a lot of fun. It's been um, worthwhile. The feedback we're getting, the emails, the the social media, we just continue to grow, continue to grow. And this work from home movement, it's not just working, it's also schooling. And so we talk about everything here on this show, from relationships to kids to business, work from home economics. It's been awesome. So I want to let all our listeners know, all 18 of you, thanks so much for listening to us. As usual, thanks for being loyal. And until next time, keep on working from home. (laughs) 